Well, my name is Christine Reiner. I am the communications coordinator contractor with the South Dakota Specialty Producers Association. Thank you for joining me today, Rachel, um, as we talk about applying for the NRCS EQUIP program. Uh, this segment is funded by our partnership with the Natural Resource Conservation Service and South Dakota Specialty Producers to promote sustainable agricultural practices and environmental stewardship. How are you today, Rachel? I'm doing good. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, I've had coffee, so I'm energized. Yeah, and I agree. I feel like we've, in our, in our midst, we've had so many conversations about equip. And I feel like I personally asked you just every silly question there is. So I'm really excited to actually get something recorded today that we can share with our producers. So it breaks it down easily. And you've done such a great job of that in the past with me personally. So thank you for being here today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, and so for our viewers, can you just kind of explain um, your history with NRCS and your background a little bit? Absolutely. So I am the state urban conservationist with NRCS. Um, this is a newer position. I've been in this role for about a year now. Um, overall to USDA, urban conservation is a new priority for us. Um, capturing a lot of the farms that we've not historically served. So cut flower producers, small scale ag, specialty production, fruits, vegetables, perennials, um, the list goes on. Um, prior to being the urban conservationist, I was located in Chamberlain as the district conservationist. Um, I've been with the agency for about four years, so still got ways to go, but exciting. Um, and yeah, and now I'm located in the Sioux Falls office, um, but again, working with the whole state of South Dakota. You're a very busy person. <laughs> Um, and great. So today we're going to cover the EQIP program. Um, is there any sort of advice before we get started? Um, if somebody is wondering if they should even take their time to apply. <laughs> well, so I think my biggest advice is just don't get overwhelmed. Um, it's easy to look at a federal government program as something that's really overwhelming, um, you know, and to think, you know, maybe I'm not eligible or there's too much paperwork or I don't know if I fit, you know, the image of what they want. And I would say, throw that all out. Don't become overwhelmed. Just come into our offices. You know, the hardest part's walking through the door um, and let us help you through the whole process. It's really what we're there for. Um, is to make sure that you have one-on-one -on -one assistance through the program. Um, and really, it's a lot of work on our end um, before we even require work on your end. So again, let us help you. Don't get overwhelmed. You know, somebody once told me the best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. And the same applies for our programs, right? One step at a time, one bite at a time, and it will all work out. And if you're watching live or from, you know, your phone while you're at work, don't worry, we'll have links um, and contact information in the comments and in our description. So if you have questions for Rachel at any time, we can connect you there too. So today specifically, we're going to be talking about EQIP, which is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, and specifically, I'm going to discuss it for small scale and specialty crop producers producers. Um, this does still uh, apply to larger scale, but just kind of how I'm going to phrase information is a little bit more for those small scale and specialty crop production systems. Um, so before we begin, I just want to kind of place where NRCS is for anyone that's not really heard of us or is kind of unfamiliar. So we're an organization under the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, formally, people know us as USDA. Um, and under USDA, they have 29 agencies um, that are all somehow ag related in some regards. Um, NRCS is one of those 29 located on 
under the farm production and conservation. Um, so all the way over, you can see we're circled in the, uh, the red. So under farm production and conservation, you also have our farm service agency, which typically deals with farm loans and emergency programs. Also, the conservation reserve program is out of that um, agency, if people are familiar with CRP. And then there's also the risk management agency, which is going to be more of your crop insurance. Right, and so then Natural Resources Conservation Service, we're gonna deal more with voluntary conservation programs. So again, we're one of the many agencies under USDA. Through the federal government, our money comes from Congress. Um, it's money that's allocated to us on an annual basis. Um, specifically coming from taxpayer dollars. And so it's really our job to the taxpayers that we allocate that money appropriately um, and that we're investing in conservation on our working land. Um, so it's always nice to know taxpayer dollars are going to a good cause, creating sustainable and regenerative agriculture practices. Now, with this said, one kind of niche thing that I have with my position is I've become very educated on a lot of the other agencies. So if NRCS may not have a grant opportunity or a kosher opportunity, there's likely another agency out there that can help you. Um, so that's just a preference kind of in the whole idea of finding funding for your farm. So just very briefly, NRCS, like I've mentioned, um, our goal is to create a sustainable and regenerative agriculture future. Um, and we do that completely voluntary, right? Somebody can walk into our office um, and talk to us about what they wanna do and they can walk right out without signing paperwork, needing to pay anything, right? We're a completely free service um, and it's voluntary. People. You know, no one's going to tell you to come. We're not regulatory, anything like that. Um, we have offices in about 99% of our counties nationwide. The only reason it's not 100 is because some offices do oversee multiple counties. Um, so, for instance, when I was in Chamberlain, I oversaw Brule and Buffalo. Um, so we were one office for two counties, right? So there's definitely someone in your area, and I'll walk through how you can find your closest the center. The other thing NRCS has, we have conservationists and planners that are going to work one on one with you for our programs, but we also have technical assistance um, and technical expertise, all the way from range management specialists, agronomists, foresters, um, you know, animal and nutrition specialists, like the works, right? And I tell people all the time, you could pay services of an agronomist, or you can come to NRCS and just use our agronomist completely for free, right? It's a nice benefit. Um, and there, of course, are things we might not be able to offer as the private agronomist might, but for someone more on the small scale that might not have um, a expandable income, I don't know if that's the word I want to use, but perhaps money's a little tighter on a small scale farm and we can offer just as quality services to you for agronomy, soil health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the programs that we're most well known for in NRCS are listed here. So we have EQIP, which I'll talk a little bit more in depth about. Um, we also have CSP, which is the Conservation Stewardship Program. Um, CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. And to preference this, this is actually a program through Farm Service Agency, FSA, but we work closely with FSA to provide the technical assistance for CRP. So we can't claim it as our own program, but we do kind of have our hand in helping implement that program. Um, and then we also have easements, which a lot of people may be aware of, um, emergency assistance, and a lot of other kind of local initiatives that come out of our program and things that may vary by so traditionally, NRCS has always worked with larger scale farms. Um, it's kind of how we were built around um, during the Dust Bowl. Um, but as we've progressed, we're seeing a huge need for the specialty crop production 
systems, right? So anything that's kind of not traditional agriculture. And as I've mentioned before, it's a whole host of different systems from um, cut flowers and honey to orchards, vineyards, hobby and subsistence growers, vegetable farms, food sovereignty movements. Um, and so there's not really one definition that I, as an urban conservationist, work with. Um, and we don't have one because we don't want to leave anyone out. So as I have here on this slide, I say we define a farm as um, a place that would or would have sold at least $1,000 of ag income. Now, this isn't a hard definition, but it is kind of a nice guiding way to say, as the federal government, these are kind of the, the sizes we're looking for. Um, but even then, you don't have to fit a specific size for us to work with you, right? We're all encompassing to everybody. So when we talk about equip, right, we're talking about conservation. And I look at conservation kind of like a house, right? Like I look at your farm as a house and above ground is where production happens. It's where your economics happens. It's your revenues, your inputs, your outputs, um, everything that's going on for your farm that you may profit from, right? That's the bedroom and the kitchen and the man cave. <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but without a good foundation, your farm will eventually crumble, right? There's, omen, there's only so many nutrients in the soil that can produce healthy crops. And there's only so many years with good weather, right? Eventually, the hail's going to come, the drought's going to come, the soil is going to need nutrients. The pests might be particularly bad. And so conservation, that really good foundation to your house is what's gonna keep your house standing. And it's what's gonna give that resilience to your house in bad weather or in a disease year or in a drought year. And so EQIP is kind of our foundational program. Um, and I kind of call it the bread and butter of NRCS. Um, it's kind of what we were really found upon is um, a program that's going to help producers, whether you're a farmer, a rancher, a forest owner, um, integrate conservation into your working lands. And that looks different for everybody, but we do kind of lead with a few different concerns um, and priorities. And I have those listed here, right? So when we look at conservation on your land, we wanna look at improving water and air quality, um, improving your ground and surface waters, your soil health, your energy efficiency, um, reducing soil erosion and sedimentation, increasing wildlife and pollinator habitat on your farm, um, and then also helping to build resiliency. So when you do have that drought year, you aren't going to be losing crop, right? And that goes for whether you're big or you're small. So EQIP is a cost share program. Um, that means we're gonna help cover some of the risk, right? Um, typically on a farm, nobody's wealthy, right? They say, you don't become rich until you sell your farm. Um, and we get it. So when we look at possibly encouraging to, or encouraging a producer to put in cover crops, or at a crop rotation, there's added cost to that and we recognize it. And so that's where EQIP covers that risk financially. So EQIP typically covers between 50 to 75% cost share. Um, different practices vary, different states may vary, but for the most part, you can expect 50 to 75%. And that will hopefully help mitigate any possible risk in adding a new management style or adding a structural tank or a fence to your farm. Um, so you can then build that foundation, to build your house. On. And like I said, we do one-on-one -on -one planning. So you come into our office, you sit down with one of our planners or our conservationists, and they're gonna walk through everything with you, right? None of EQIP is done on your own. Um, okay, well, I take that back. Eventually, you will have to manage your farm on your own. <laughs> we can't necessarily help you put in fences, but we will help you plan where that fence should be, give recommendations on what it should look like, etc. 
So I take that comment back. Eventually, you do have to manage your farm. <laughs> um, and so with our conservation plans under EQIP, everything's going to be unique, right? We don't come in and write a prescription for you that we've done for everybody. We are going to get to know your farm, get to know what your needs are, look at the concerns you have on your farm, and then build a plan with you that's going to identify ways to fix those concerns. Um, and again, to just build that foundation to then build your house upon. So when we look at small scale practices for a specialty production farm, we do have a few popular practices, um, but I should preference our practice list is many. I don't know the exact number, but I think it's above 100. <laughs> um, I think any given state is going to have over 100 different conservation practices. And that's going to be anything from cross fencing rangelands, adding um, pipeline and livestock tanks to your areas, doing crop rotation, cover crops, um, pest management, nutrient management, et cetera, right? They're all practices that we can help educate you on and then help in the cost share of mitigating that risk of implementing something new. But a few of our common practices for small scale producers, um, we have high tunnel. So high tunnel, huge program in South Dakota. I've always found that um, so many people in South Dakota really value growing their own food. Um, and so everyone kind of has a garden in their backyard and more people are getting into the idea of, hey, I have room for a high tunnel and that can provide some season extension for me, right? And so we see a huge interest in high tunnels. We also do caterpillar tunnels as well. Caterpillar tunnels are um, a little bit less kind of, or more robust than a high tunnel. They're slightly smaller, so they might be better for smaller spaces or depending on the produce that you would want to grow, um, they just may be a little bit more adaptable. Um, with high tunnels comes micro irrigation, um, doing some type of drip line within your produce. Um, that's also become very popular. We also have uh, windbreaks and shelter belts, and I have the, the apple trees here. So we don't necessarily plant fruit bearing trees for production, right? Like we can't plant you an orchard, but if potentially you would like to protect some high value crops from wind, um, from potential drift, or you would like to add wildlife habitat, um, we can plant trees and shrubs. And as an urban conservationist, I look at that and I say, well, why don't we make them fruit bearing trees and shrubs so they can have a big purpose, right? And so that's where I can kind of get in some apple trees and some choke cherries and apricots um, and cranberries, et cetera, et cetera. So we can also kind of look at how we can get multiple purposes out of the practice. Another one um, is gonna be mulching or cover crops. So soil health in South Dakota is a really huge buzzword for us. It's really something we strive to do. Um, our soils are almost always in need of more organic matter. So whatever we can do um, to get more organic matter on the field, we're gonna take that opportunity. Cover crops has long been something that South Dakota has done very well in, um, but it's not always applicable on our smaller farms. We might not just we just don't have the rotation for it. Um, you know, we can't provide that time because we're maybe growing um, other winter hardy vegetables. So I look at mulching as another opportunity where we can still get organic matter. We can have that soil armor and that soil cover um, and still help build that. Some other practices, um, composting is another practice I'm seeing others get interested in. Um, and again, a great way to recycle and upcycle your yard waste, your grass clippings, things that are left over from your flower production, um, compost it and then put it back onto your soil, right? So I think that's gonna be getting pretty popular too. We also have two interim practices. Um, raised beds and low tunnels. So interim practices, they're temporary practices that we're trying out. 
um, we have decided to try them out in South Dakota to see are these practices that are gonna work for us and our producers. Um, and so those are gonna be available in the next EQIP round. So we're really excited about that. Um, the idea is that we wanna get them out onto the land to evaluate their success. You know, the cost that was allocated towards them, the labor that a producer might have. So we're excited to get those out. Definitely looking for people who are interested in them. And then the last one I'll mention here, um, down in the corner, we kind of have a hydroponics. So unfortunately, we don't offer hydroponics as a practice yet, but I put this in here because I think in the direction we're going, we're gonna have a lot more um, opportunities for innovative practices and practices that might not deal necessarily with growing directly into the ground. Um, we have a new farm bill on the horizon. And so there's been a lot of talk about more opportunities coming for specialty producers. So I cross my fingers that that's gonna happen. Um, and we'll kind of see where urban conservationist urban conservation will go. Um, so where do you start, right? So again, like I said, don't get overwhelmed, right? I think the biggest things if you take away from this presentation are one, think about what your conservation goals are and like, what are your needs? Are you seeing that the crops or the vegetables are growing as well? So maybe you need organic matter. Or do you have some water erosion? Maybe you need that. Or do you want to plant crops a little bit earlier? Maybe a high tunnel is something you're interested in, right? So think about your needs. Um, and then find your local service center and come into our offices, right? If you do nothing else and you remember nothing else, those are the two most important things. Because once you do make it into our office, we'll cover it from there, right? We will go on the journey together to make a plan and to hopefully get that funded for you. Other things that you will eventually be doing, you'll register for a farm number, you'll look at eligibility, you'll fill out an application and you'll start planning with the conservationist. So again, those are all things that we're gonna assist you with. So don't get overwhelmed. And good. So I briefly want to touch on this. So beginning farmer and rancher and historically underserved. Um, so the USDA recognizes that there's various groups nationwide that may require more need than others. Um, and particularly, these are going to be beginning farmers and historically underserved individuals. Um, so beginning farmers, you're just starting out. Um, and that can be difficult to um, find the money that might help the farm. So with beginning farmer and historically underserved groups, our cost share rate does go up. Um, sometimes it's upwards to 80 to 90% cost share. Again, it varies, but we cover a lot more of the risk in helping put conservation on your land. Um, historically underserved, especially here in South Dakota, we've identified those as our tribal nations where um, we can provide more assistance for them to make sure that they have an equitable share in our agriculture as well. So beginning farmer and rancher typically is defined as how many years you have claimed agriculture income. Um, so if you're 10 years or less claiming agriculture income, then you are able to apply as a beginning farmer. Um, and then in South Dakota, if you are a tribal member, then you can apply as historically underserved. So now I'm going to just show you a few resources um, that I've talked a little bit about and kind of where you can find them online. So. Um, I tell people with the government, Google is your friend. You can virtually Google anything with NRCS attached to it, and you will likely find exactly what you're looking for. So this is our Natural Resources Conservation Service webpage for South Dakota. Um, if you're viewing from another state, Google your state and NRCS. I promise it will bring you right to it. 
Um, and this is kind of the best starting place. The most important information on this page is gonna be right here. Find your local service center. So you're gonna go ahead and input your county. And I'm gonna say, well, yep, you choose your state first. Um, then you find your county. So I live in Minnehaha. So I'm gonna go ahead and find Minnehaha. There we are. Um, and I'm gonna search. And it's gonna bring you right up to where our office is. So we're located um, on Benson, right off of 229. The NRCS side, you also have Farm Service Agency and Rural Development, all within our Sioux Falls Service Center. The contact for NRCS is Dan Waymeyer. Leah Turgeon is there for the Farm Service Agency, and then Michael Fry, who's there for Rural Development, right? And again, you can do this with any state, with any county. Um, you have the number to call, you have somebody to email if you so choose, or you just come on in for our office. Um, and that's also how people, people find us. So again, great website there. Um, the other one you can Google, eQuip and RCS. Um, that's gonna bring you more to the national webpage for eQuip. But again, a lot of really good information here. Um, it's gonna talk a little bit more about how eQuip works um, and go into a few more of those details, the benefits, um, et cetera, et cetera. They also have these really awesome conservation work videos. And so I can show you those real quick. Here they are. Um, these are videos that our national team has done that talks about the various programs that we've done. And I mean, seriously, there's seven plus pages of videos. Um, one here specifically was on high tunnels. So if you're curious to see what high tunnels funded by NRCS look like, it's right here. Um, or cover crops, et cetera, brush management, all the work. So great resource as well. Um, and then again, we have historically underserved, sorry, the, there's the sharing bar. So I have to like, yeah, it's hard to see. <laughs> I figured you could probably just add that out. Um, we also have historically underserved farmers and ranchers, um, something that you can look more into if you think this may apply to you. It does discuss a little bit more what we might consider a beginning farmer or rancher or someone that's limited resources or socially disadvantaged. So again, something to look into. We might also have opportunities for veteran farmers and ranchers too. So again, something to consider. So the last bit that I'll mention here, we do have a really great document for new farmers um, or new producers. So this is something that we can also add to the link. It's just gonna go over what NRCS, FSA, and RMA have to offer. Um, they'll talk a little bit about each agency. They've even mentioned rural development, which is often associated with NRCS and FSA. Um, but the best part about this is it's gonna talk about getting started. Um, and again, don't get overwhelmed by all of this, right? The biggest thing is before your meeting. So make an appointment or just walk in one day, that's totally fine too. Um, otherwise, there's really not that much you have to do before your meeting. You know, consider what your needs are, come into our office, and then we're gonna take it from there. During your meeting, things that you could expect to happen, um, we may register you for a farm number if you don't have one. Um, traditionally, traditionally large-scale farms all have already had farm numbers for decades. Um, but someone who may be farming on their homestead or in their backyard, a farm number is not going to be something you're familiar with. But it's virtually kind of an identification number of your farm in our system. So things that you're going to need is going to be your social security number, um, as well as some type of property deed. So then we can connect you to your land and then identify your land in our system. We do also have some various eligibility requirements as well, um, but again, it's nothing to be 
worried about. Um, you know, we do like to check for wetlands and highly erodible lands to make sure that what we do want to do um, is eligible um, under our programs. And then also we have an adjusted gross income of $900,000, which again, is just something we check for eligibility with our programs. So the one thing that I did not preference before that I just want to touch upon. Um, so all of our programs are competitive programs. So it's not guaranteed that you're going to get funding, right? Just because you came into our office and you did the work doesn't guarantee that you're going to get funded. Um, I dearly wish it did. <laughs> but because we are trying to allocate taxpayer dollars appropriately. Um, we want to make sure that the system we have in place to rank applications and to make those judgment calls on what application does get funded. Um, it does mean that there might be some people that don't get funded, there's not enough money to go around, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but working with our planners, we're going to put together the absolute best application uh, that we hope is going to do very, very well. Um, and again, it's not to get into the nitty gritty, but just something to keep in mind that we're gonna do our very best, but we can never guarantee that you're definitely going to get funded. So I believe that's kind of everything I had. Um, I encourage people to contact me if there's other questions, you know, down the line or you Googled something and it didn't show up. You're like, you promised me it would call me and <laughs> we can find it together. Um, text or email, this is my information here. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I have. Um, thanks so much. What do you have for me? Rachel, that was amazing. You um, you know, before all these interviews, I have a little list of questions and, and you answered all of them. Um, so it was just really great to to have the visual representation to walk through with the equip because, you know, NRCS has multiple programs and I think um, it can be a little confusing knowing which one you're supposed to be in. But that is the great thing about NRCS is where else can you just show up, walk in, say, I need help. And then somebody is willing to map out your farm and help you come up with, you know, your ideal setup for operations. So. Thank you again for sharing. Um, we have a load of, of links and information to share. And so if anybody has questions, please put them in the comments. We'll try to respond as fast as we can. Um, but if you know you you really can't find an answer to your question, like Rachel said, um, it's best and probably quickest to just send a, an email, a phone call, or, or find your closest representative. Um, Google does help quite a bit. I mean, NRCS, not only can you find incentives and programs, but they also have an array of articles and and different things that are going on. So um, I encourage anybody who's just has some time and wants to research current conservation methods going on in our state. Um, it's a really, really great website. So in the meantime, Rachel, um, I hope that we connect soon. I um, always enjoy learning from you and, and connecting with NRCS. It's always so great to work with you guys. Thanks so much. We love you all too. <laughs> all right. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you want any more information about the South Dakota specialty producers or any current events going on, you can visit our website at sdspecialtyproducers.org or our Facebook page. Um, pretty much any social media app. <laughs> if you have questions or again, you'd like to contact Rachel, um, feel free to reach out. And in the meantime, please watch our recap of this past year's webinars where we hosted producer educational um, videos just like this one. So if you have other questions about resources or things going on in South Dakota, you can also check out our YouTube. My name is Christine Reiner, and this event has been funded by a partnership with NRCS and the South Dakota Specialty Producers to promote environmental stewardship and agricultural practices. So I hope everybody has a good day. Thank you.